In loving dedication to Nico B and his efforts to go out of his normal scope of content and make a high quality, full, long form video essay, I feel, out of a sense of respect for his craft and passion, for me to make an equally passionate video about how much I fucking hate 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. When I saw the video on my notifications, I actually got a little confused because I didn't remember that the subtitle of the game was Aegis Rim. I knew it had some, one of those dumbass, pointless anime subtitles, but I couldn't recall what it was. And the custom thumbnail that Nika commissioned for his video looked very professional, but not of the same art style as the game. So for a moment, I thought he was reviewing, like, a spin-off book or something. Okay, obviously, people are gonna take take a certain vibe with this premise. Nico's video is really good and it's cool that people like the game and stuff, you know, more power to them. I'm not I'm not here to contradict people's feelings. I'm just adding my own cuz I thought it'd make for entertainment and entertaining topics since there's not a lot of stuff that I hate with the same level of um, vitriol as this. To be clear, this is not like a conversion therapy thing. Please only watch this if you're interested in the sport of politely disagreeing with people about their media opinions. Even if you respect other people's media opinions from your own. I've had instances where, you know, I liked something and then I watched someone's review or analysis of why they hated it. And even if I disagreed with them and I kept my initial opinion, it still would hurt my enjoyment to go back to the same media because whenever I'd see something they talked about, I'd my brain would get tickled, I'd be reminded of their pessimistic way of viewing that, and then it would, uh, it would sour things and make it harder to enjoy the media with simple earnesty. So please, be warned, watch out of, uh, love of opinions and shit-talking, not out of an obligation to engage with a dissenting opinion. In preparation for this video, I released another video just a few days ago of me going over all the important events of plot chronologically and occasionally voicing my problems with it very loosely. I'll be referring to that reading of the plot for context in this video and any corrections I might have made to it. So feel free to look over, correct any other errors you believe I, I, I would have made. Um, what do I like about the game in the first place? Let's start off on a positive note. Of course, there has to be some aspect of quality for me to even have strong negative feelings over the game. Like, I'm not looking at zero-budget Steam asset flip games with, and then getting viciously angry about their lack of quality. Of course they suck. No one's gonna, no one's gonna, no one's gonna hold that against them. So, production value is pretty solid across the board. I recently played through it a second time for the sake of this video, so it's still pretty fresh in my mind. I wasn't a fan of the gameplay on launch, but they've drastically updated it since then. They Now with a lot of character-specific abilities and rebalancing things, I think the gameplay is actually pretty solid. The, if, the official character artwork is beautiful. It's one of those things where I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of the character designs in-game, but when you look at like the high-res pinup art for each character, there's a lot of like texture and lighting and detail to it that to the character designs that looks a million times better and more distinct from just like the generic anime school uniform, generic anime haircut designs that they look like in game. Let's see, I like I like Miwako's design. It is refreshing in anime stuff to see hot chubby characters rather than fat joke chubby characters. Unfortunately, most of the comedy, quote-unquote, is still unable to escape from the most trite anime shit, like, uh, like, oh, this character has this cartoonish fixation with a certain food. Tons of gay panic laughs. I like Okino. You know, he's hot. I, 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 I do stuff with him. Um, Goto is also, you know, a cookie-cutter anime trope, but he's, he's cool. I like him. I, I'm fine with him. I like Tomi. She has a great VA in both the Japanese and the English, and her dialogue usually doesn't suck. I understand the corporate desire to capitalize on some form of revenue with Natsuno merchandise sales and sexy figurines. When I had nothing to occupy my mind during some of the more boring scenes in the game, I did find myself staring at Natsuno's legs pretty often. Nenji's section seems to be universally pretty liked. Uh, that's the only point where I agree. His is his his section is short. 
self-contained, entertaining, it's a little, you know, mock-up, it's fun, you know, like, um, I like a couple of lines individually, I like the line, I'm a high school girl with a giant robot, that's still easily the best line in the script. I like the line, you're the girl that shat on my hair. I like the part where they leave the city and find they're in this metal disc construct. I like the, t the talking cat introduction. I get Okay, I guess that's not really fair. I like the first couple hours of the game. They're fine, in my opinion. The introduction of all the weird shit at the start is when it's most batshit and when it's like strengths are apparent. Probably because it was written with the... the opening couple hours in mind, and then the rest of it was just thought of afterwards. But anyways, because it keeps flipping into, like, new, unexplained, bizarro nonsense, like talking cats or women in latex with fat asses and stuff, I like, at least on a conceptual level, that a lot- that a couple of the twists are that it's not actually as sci-fi as you think it is, because there's no time travel, a lot of the stuff you see might not exist in the real world, like, the androids are technology that were made by Ida. They don't actually necessarily exist in reality, the Sentinels as well, etc. This has nothing to do with the content of the game, but I like how it it somehow did the impossible and had long-term sales overcome this piss-poor launch. That's pretty wild, and it doesn't happen very often. As much as this was my most disliked game of 2020, the underdog story of the game's passionate fanbase is still and an uplifting sight to behold. Okay, enough compliments and being nice. That's not why we're here. It's not we don't get up in the morning. We we get up in the morning to hate and to be hated. Let's all calm down and try to diffuse this anger. No way, I'm mad and I like it. Me too. So, some caveats out of the way. Usually when I hate something and I describe what I don't like about it, I'm very self-conscious about having all of my facts straight. I don't want to be in a situation where someone I'm debating with knows more than me on the subject. However, this is a rare case where fact-checking everything is a big slog, and I haven't memorized, like, every mystery file, you know, etc. So, I'm not sure if there's mistranslations in the localized version that, like, do a poor job of explaining certain details that might be make more sense in other versions or other, other media, etc. Also, this is something that I say for any media, but things that you like are infinitely more important than things that you dislike. So, disliking a game based on criticisms alone is reductive and arbitrary. So, while I have many criticisms of the game, the actual reason that I don't like it is simply because there's I don't have things that I like about it. I am not impressed by it. Nothing about it charms me. It lacks any strong positive for me. At best, it simply exists. Also, that means any criticisms that I have are not really that important. They're window dressing, like an annoyance where I would have preferred a positive. And in isolation, any one of my criticisms is probably not a big deal, but they're more compounded by how many there are and the fact that they're going up against my complete lack of enjoyment for anything in it. Which brings us to the real dividing line I think I see here between myself and fans of the game. I believe we're looking at the same things, but they are impressed by it and or entertained by it, and I am not. There's a couple logical discrepancies, you know, I, I think like some people are overlooking certain plot holes and certain illogic in the plot, but mainly I think it comes down to that vague difference of consumption. Now, the first things I take huge issue with in Nico's video, and this is a sentiment that I see from all ton like almost every fan of this game that I've seen voice their praises of it. This type of non-linear storytelling is one of the game's strongest points, because it essentially makes every playthrough a completely unique experience to the person playing. Your playthrough will likely not be the same as another person's. There's a lot of misconceptions about non-linear storytelling, and these are some of my biggest pet peeves. The idea that everyone's playthrough is different. Let's start there. First of all, I don't really know why this is meant to be an appeal in the first place, even theoretically. From an anthropological angle, 
Maybe it's interesting to analyze a large population of players and then break down the statistics of their patterns and, uh, and choices and the results and that sort of thing. But I've never understood this vague assertion that having a different path than another player is supposed to be some positive that is supposed to improve your experience with it. I think the emotion behind the appeal is this sort of like delusional kind of I'm special narrative feeling like, oh man, oh, I'm so unique because no one else played through this game exactly the same way I did. It's like a play to the ego, you know, I just find it baffling because games are inherently, like all games inherently have player interaction, that's what makes them games. Meaning almost all video games ever made have unique player experiences because of how a player chooses to interact with them. You play something like uh, Sifu, came out last year, your experience is determined by your personality and your choices and your habits and what they lead you to. You might go back to earlier levels more often to optimize them with fewer deaths before moving on to the next area. You might choose different abilities and choose how to use those abilities tactfully and um, develop certain behavioral patterns of how you interact with the gameplay that other players don't. And these all shape your opinions in the media as well because it all influences your experience with it. Like uh, leaning heavily on spot dodging while others might primarily focus on parrying first. You know, other games have way more choices per, per unit of time, per minute of gameplay, that craft their lived experience with the media. Beyond that, this kind of my playthrough is unique baloney is also a delusion from people who don't know how psychology impacts their choices. Take like uh, Breath of the Wild, that's another thing that people use this this dumbass assumption that they are somehow special or there's this like grand uh, epic butterfly effect going on, but in reality, the vast majority of players make very similar macro and micro choices in certain situations. People are not really that different, unless they arbitrarily go out of their way to have a different objective, like uh, a speedrunner is going to play in a different way than a normal person, but like the lighting, the sight lines, the shape of the landscape in, in Breath of the Wild, you're, you're being psychologically guided into making similar natural choices. You come out of this doorway facing this direction, your eye glances over the landscape. It's just basic graphic design, basic everything, you know? Any thought that you have in your head at any point in time is probably an unoriginal thought that a hundred thousand other players have also thought. Like, <laughs> give up. You're not special. Most games have differences in player path and mentality, development, and patterns. Most people are more similar than you think, and there's no point to it anyways because it doesn't improve your actual experience. So, next misconception. Successfully achieving this type of narrative structure is no small feat either. One of the many struggles of telling a nonlinear story is maintaining plot cohesion. Oh man, it is so impressive how they managed to craft this nonlinear story in such a way that it still works. You can like enjoy it as a as a story. This is just a matter of disconnect between the consumer and the creator. You say that it's extremely difficult to make a non-linear story, but have you ever tried to? Do you personally, have you tried, do you know that it's difficult? Because it isn't. The human brain is made to organize pieces of information. You learn what happened at time frame A, then at time frame C, then at time frame B. Your brain handles it effortlessly, it does the work, it understands the linearity. It's not something the creator needs to craft for you. Your brain just flat out is capable of consuming any story in any order whatsoever, period. You'll fill in the blanks until you see the connective tissue. Anything from reading, like, the lore descriptions of items in Elden Ring, to something like uh, that new Netflix show that came out at the start of the month, the kaleidoscope thing with Giancarlo Esposito, where you can watch the gimmick of the show is you can watch it in any order. Even that impresses me more than fucking 13 Sentinels. In 13 Sentinels, the prologue is laid out and the ending is laid out. You can you can only do like Goto and Hijiyama at the end and the ending ending is super laid out. As well as specific pieces of information that are locked behind spe specific stories you must complete ahead of time. The only divergence point is picking up all the superficial data in the middle. In Kaleidoscope, you are supposed to watch the episodes in any order that you want, period. 
so any episode might be your first episode or it might be your last. There is no fixed beginning or ending, so each episode needs to give you enough to follow at least that episode's plot without additional context, and each episode also needs to end feeling like a satisfying conclusion to the overarching story if that episode happens to be your last. Taking the middle of a story and jumbling it around is not fucking difficult or impressive. It doesn't need to be crafted, it is just something the human brain handles automatically, for fuck's sake. Most stories take advantage of the fact that the brain reorganizes information naturally. You get a flashback in the middle of a story. That's non-linear storytelling. There's an old event that your brain now has to recontextualize or reorganize into your overall understanding of the timeline. Like, g god damn it, man. It is not impressive. The story of 13 Sentinels could have been literally just cut up and spat out by a fucking algorithm made to randomize a plot, and it would be just as effective. It would work the same way. Don't be impressed by something because that your brain handles with ease, that requires zero effort or ability to do, just because you have this, this made-up idea in your head that surely it must be incredibly difficult, that you just, you're just assuming for no reason. The other thing that makes it even less impressive in 13 Sentinels is that the, the majority of scenes are just characters talking and giving the audience some piece of information or like some ob some obnoxious reference to a thing you'll learn about later on. There are a couple of events that happen in the story, but for the most part, for most of the run, you're not following an event-driven plot. It is mostly just exposition, with the exception of the backstory. This is the first major irritation I have is that people just assume that this is somehow impressive, with no evidence. They're just like, uh, it, it must take a fucking genius to structure this. Why? Like, I'd be fine if people said it's fun. You know, some things are just naturally fun. I understand that. Even a piece of, like, a piece of media being enjoyable is not necessarily the same thing as it being impressive. Something can be easy to write, but still naturally fun. So, some media is fun and barely took any effort or talent to create, and some media is not that enjoyable, but took a shitload of effort and attention to detail to create. That's fine, you know? But I do get annoyed when people praise something and say that it is impressive just by inventing the idea that it somehow took a massive amount of talent, and then praise it for that talent that they invented. It just boggles my mind. Now, as for the fun factor of non-linear structure, I agree, but just like I said earlier, a lot of media, a lot of games and a lot of other media have this sort of detective piecing things together kind of experience if you choose to do it. I mean, that's literally what, that that is what literary analysis is. You're going through a story, you already know, you're piecing things together, you're trying to find out the connections, the ideas, the thematic structure. All the way back to your, your fucking high school English class, having you write papers on Lord of the Flies. That's non-linear structure. That's detective work. That is analysis. Granted, there's a difference between a guided detective story and something that doesn't hold your hand. In something like 13 Sentinels, you can theorize while playing, but you don't... You don't have to. You can just play the game, and eventually it will spit the information into your face. Detective work or not, whether you thought about it or not, it will eventually just tell you what's going on. In that sense, it's a bit different. It is not really so much a detective story that relies on your effort as the consumer to piece things together in your mind. It's more just a very long, drawn-out story that drip-feeds you small nuggets of data and, in the meantime, allows you to entertain yourself with theory crafting until it eventually carries on with giving you the information to confirm which of your theories is accurate. Now again, this sort of theory crafting is also an experience anyone gets with literary analysis of any media ever made. Hell, if you use Death of the Author, you can have ex experience with anything. I've watched, you know, like Ben Saint's video essays on for Winnie the Pooh and how it's a deep psychosexual philosophy piece. It's fun. It's it's all theory crafting, you know? You look at data, and then you come up with creative ways of fitting that data into some thematically consistent narrative. Yes, I agree. Theory crafting is fun, but I do it all the time. It's not a unique experience for me. It's not something that's limited to a game like this. Off the top of my head, games in 2022, better and more satisfying detective gameplay, 
case of the Golden Idol. Better and more satisfying non-linear analysis and theory crafting and piecing together a completely jumbled up non-linear story, Immortality. Okay, actual talk, Immortality is much more about like subtle documentary feeling anthro examinations than something like 13 Sentinels, which is very much about tactile anime-ass plot points. But if you like 13 Sentinels for the reasons that, and you're into like weird thematic art house shit, you should probably play Mortality as well. It holds your hand a lot less than 13 Sentinels, and the batshit insane elements of the story aren't obvious at a glance, but they are there. It's very good, and it's literally a game about finding and sorting through mo movie, movie footage. It's the definition of player initiated detective work. You want an insane, high detail sci-fi story like 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 future sci-fi, endearing characters, crazy plot twists, detective work, a million fucking routes, and the most sci-fi shit imaginable. Play I was a teenage exocolonist. Case of the Golden Idol is a small, little, immaculately made detective game. Immortality and I was a teenage exocolonist are both games with infinitely more ambition, creativity, dedica dedication to craft boldness than this derivative anime game, 13 Sentinels. Uh, anyways. Yes, theory crafting while playing a story with clear actual plot is is kind of weird to me because it's one of those e ephemeral experiences. Like, you can play most video games and enjoy the gameplay or the emotional beats of a story on a second playthrough in almost the same way. But if you played through something like 13 Sentinels a second time, you won't get the same sort of theory crafting enjoyment because once you know the plot, you know the plot. I've always been vocally unsupportive of these kinds of first playthrough only types of appeals. I don't deny that they do exist and they can be fun, but I still think they're a bit conceptually flawed. Just play the case of the Golden Idol, it's so fucking good. For 13 Sentinels, my issues with the theory crafting mostly come from my issues with the plot, which I guess I'll talk about later on. Next, Nico talks about all the references and reused concepts from other media, mostly sci-fi media. Uh, and here, I'm just coming in raw and saying, yes, I find this all extremely derivative. This also extends to commonalities between this and a lot of other anime media, not just western sci-fi. This game has some of the laziest attempts at subversion and reconstruction I've seen in a long time, to the point that it really doesn't even fit those definitions. Never mind that almost every character is some generic anime trope, and every scene that's more characters just spouting exposition back and forth is some generic anime trope, and there isn't si a single original concept in this at all. It's just lazy. I think the idea of twists on expectation kind of clash with the structure of theory crafting in experience. Like, okay, like, the last thing I watched that made me think one thing, but then got a reaction or emotional investment out of me or my gradual and or sudden understanding that it was going to play out differently was Funny Pages last year. 2022. Funny Pages is an extremely in an extremely oversimplified description of it, uh, has this relationship where an antisocial man that used to work at a major comic book studio meets our younger protagonist trying to break into the career in, in the industry, and the kid weans his way into inspiring the man to revive a bit of hope in his own abilities, and they start thinking that maybe it's possible for him to go back to his dream work. And the kid through this icy gets through his icy exterior and starts getting closer to with him, as a mentor figure and invites him to his family's Christmas dinner so that he can uh, teach him some craft and stuff. Anyways, there's a, this levity and comedy to the film, and while it's not very overt, you can see the path, the stereotypical path to the happy ending, clear as day, but the seeds of reality have already been planted throughout the film, and as the incredibly uncomfortable Christmas Day events unfold and the man's social ineptitudes and anxieties and disposition to violence creates more and more unavoidable consequences, as the reality sets in that all of these characters are realistically not going to make it into this highly competitive industry, you feel this sickening twist of the knife as the future that you so clearly envisioned from just optimism and trope literacy slips away with such authenticity and such truth. 
I think that's very different from just referencing real-life books and movies and then patting yourself on the back because your story isn't a one-to-one, a hundred percent exact copy that the material it steals from. Even though at the end of the day, the story is still entirely made up of unoriginal, unoriginal tropes and cliches. There's no real twist on expectation. This is like the kind of media where you go in expecting twists. And your theory crafting of what's going on revolves around anticipating these twists. I don't think a single organic human being on the planet has ever played this game and expected the story to just be a straight one-to-one -one rip of what it steals iconography from. Like, uh, for... from BJ to phone home or whatnot, or for the, the Megami to go into fucking Madoka Magica shit. None of those cases would make any sense given what you've already seen in the rest of the story. Besides, all of these ideas it copies from are so famous that those ideas themselves have already been reused and redone in so many other pieces of media since then over the years that we've already seen and gotten used to not just the originals, but also every way of subverting them. To the point that they're not subversions at all anymore, they are now just more tropes. Any subversion implies that there's a reason to expect that one understanding of the story makes sense. You can just look with your eyeballs and smell with your butthole and instantly tell that certain expectations do not make any sense and fit in with the info you have in the story. It's not an E.T. story, but it's subverted. It's just some completely different fucking generic sci-fi story, but they slap E.T. iconography on top of it. I dare you to show me a flesh and blood soul that went through the fucking leg girl Natsuno section and screamed, Oh my god! I expected it to go just like E.T., but it didn't! I'm so surprised! I really thought BJ would have some magic floating powers like fucking Uraraka from Boku no Hero and that BJ would phone home. So no, in my experience, nothing in this game past the first five hours is surprising in any way whatsoever because it's all a bunch of twists and tropes you've seen a million times before in countless other fucking sci-fi stories and, and anime stories and nothing is out of the box of expectations. Nothing expands what is possible in these sort of narratives. It's just like countless other oversaturated stories that just use these exact same tropes, but just a complete mess of different things being shoved together with no rhyme or reason. Just because something takes a concept or trope, or even just like this surface level iconography that already exists and uses it in a different narrative with a different plot that isn't exactly the same doesn't mean it's not derivative. Using Groundhog, using a Groundhog Day loop for the same appeals as that concept has been used for in so many other sci-fi stories is derivative. The actual movie of Groundhog Day is m so much deeper and explores the concept in so many more technical and philosophical ways. This doesn't. That is the definition of derivative. It just takes the concept and does the bare fucking minimum with it. Absolutely deriding what it originally was. Everything is a surface level ripoff to slap on top of a story that has nothing to do with any of the deeper values at play in any of the things that it's copying. To slap onto a pulpy, dumb, fucking anime story that's just about bad shit, insane things happening for the sake of themselves, using, an ex using any excuse possible to make them happen. That is the definition of derivative. And I don't even know why I'm talking about this, because most media has a million references and connective ideas to other famous works, and they don't slap you in the face as aggressively as this. Again, the only plot point I thought was even remotely clever in this was the fact that there is no time travel. And even then, that comes with the caveat that for the story to have this twist, it has to be the dumbest, most contrivance-riddled monstrosities known to man, and, and so conveniently structure its world and the choices of characters in the backstory in such a way so as to perfectly accidentally make a situation where characters could look at something and think that there's time travel but then later have a twist where it's not actually time travel. So, no, that's also fucking stupid, and I still can't call it a, a good twist, because the plot is so insanely illogical and contrived and just dumb as fuck to force the narrative to go in this direction so just so that it could have this twist. Nico goes into, like, audio design and music at this point in the video. I guess I'll slap this in. Um, 
the music is nice. It's fine. I guess I have no other, uh, I have no other opinions. I don't know. It's not, I usually don't like, um, most JRPG soundtracks. I feel like they're, a lot of the times they're very corny and obnoxious and, um, jumping the gun with over-dramatizing everything and they all sound really fucking generic, but... This is not as bad as other ones. Uh, the VA, especially the English localization, is much better than most other English localizations for anime games. It's very high quality, but the voice acting can't save, like, lifeless or just bad dialogue and characterization or bland copy-and-paste cliché characters, so it doesn't stick out that much in my mind as a strong positive. At the very least, I'll give this game kudos for not having overly emotional characters like in a lot of bad anime stories where characters a character will like stub his toe on a desk and then start screaming and crying about fate and forging your destiny and being true to yourself and the power of fucking friendship. I guess I like Tomi's VA. Her line delivery elevates the character to make her feel more lived in unlike most of the other ones. Most of the cast do, honestly, like... The characters are just too bland to leave an impact. The lines are just too inhuman and lifeless. This is probably more of a personal preference thing, but I like when VA gets done outside of a studio. A lot of these project, a lot of these projects take like overly clean, sanitized line deliveries that feel very artificial, especially in context. So this is on the much better end of localizations for sure. Okay, fuck. Now I have to talk about the plot. Now again, this is going to be one of those things where if people talk about what they interpret from the story's messages, I can only really respond with, I'm not impressed. Just one of those things where everything in the game is so overwhelmingly cliched and generic. It's such a fucking anime in every negative t connotation of the word anime. There's nothing in the story that I can take seriously in terms of pathos, so all I have left is to bitch about the plot. A contrivance is defined as an aspect of literature that brings about artificiality. Pretty vague definition. In practice, contrivance is used in tandem with the term plot hole. It's, it's like a less aggressive way of saying plot hole. Actually, if what I'm seeing on Twitter is an unfortunate reflection of the human race, people don't even know what plot hole means either. A plot hole is something that cannot happen in a narrative. Something that actively just ref does not make sense. A contradiction. Now, due to the nature of fiction, anything can make sense at any given time because there are no rules or restrictions or laws of physics. If a story accidentally has a character in two places at once, well, it's fiction. You could make something up. You could argue that it's not a plot hole because even though it's never mentioned in the narrative, it's possible that a clone exists that could perform this action. So, in a way, plot holes kind of don't exist because you can always bend reality and fiction to any extent to cover up for a mistake. Let me take a recent example. In the movie Barbarian, from last year, the monster is said to come out at night. I guess to, like, hunt for stray people or animals or whatever. I don't know what the fuck it's doing at night, but she goes out at night. We see this in the film early on with the door to the basement closing at night. Now, the basement has a window that doesn't open far enough for a person to fit through, and especially not the monster, who's much larger than a normal person. A passage into the underground tunnels, and the basement door, which locks automatically when it closes, and it closes by itself because it slides shut due to gravity. As far as we see, there is no other exit. There is no place in the system of tunnels underneath the house where it's possible to find another way out. So theoretically, and this is also what's implied by the movie, if the monster goes out at night, it seems like there is no other option than for her to come out of the door to the basement. But that is physically impossible because it is locked and it does not open from that side. And we never see any key that might unlock it in the basement side. So, it's based on the information provided in the story, it's not actually physically possible for the monster to come out n at night in the way the film is telling us that she does. Ergo, this is a plot hole. It is a contradiction of information given to us by the story. A contrivance isn't strictly a contradiction, but it is still something that f is illogical. A contrivance is something that feels overly convenient, something that is not natural, something that almost certainly wouldn't actually happen that way. An extreme coincidence, and this is sometimes up for debate. If a story has something that is, like, insanely unlikely to occur, it can feel artificial or it can feel intentional. Like, um... 
like a story might ha have an event like, oh, against the odds, this happened. Isn't that crazy? That's like an instance where something unlikely occurs, but it is clearly intentional. It's like a dramatic irony. More 2022 examples. I watched um, Bullet Train, and the movie talks a lot about luck and fate. And, it, you know, extremely unlikely things occur in that movie, but it all feels very intentional. It feels like it fits within the rules of the universe because of how much luck is a factor in the lives of these characters. But then you have it, unlikely stuff like this shit. You see, there is a reason that Kirito has to fight Death Gun, but it's got nothing to do with what makes sense in the context of the story, and everything to do with how the story was written. Death Gun has been built up as Kirito's big rival, so of course it stands to reason that the two of them are gonna fight in the end. You could have figured that much out from the opening scene alone. But it's precisely because it's so obvious that you never stop to think about how little sense it makes. Given everything we know about Death Gun, about this situation, and even about Kirito, who was reluctant to take this job in the first place, it seems like the most logical course of action would be to log out now, have the tournament postponed, and open an investigation on Death Gun's character. But because it's already been determined from the beginning at the conceptual stage that Kirito and Death Gun need to have a gigantic final battle at the end, that's exactly what happens, regardless of how it fits the narrative. Since that during B.O.B., you can't log out on your own. What? Wait, what? Hold on, hold on, what? Wait, but you can forfeit, right? Kirito just told Shinon that she should log out like a minute ago. Wait, hold on, this can't possibly be legal. You have to be kidding me. Please say you aren't telling me that you physically cannot log out during B.O.B. Please tell me that this is not still a fucking thing. I can't believe it. I can't believe this is still happening. How many people have to die before this shit becomes illegal? At this point, anyone who puts on one of these helmets, which makes your real life body completely useless and then willingly subjects themselves to a scenario in which they can't log out deserves a Darwin Award after their inevitable homicide. So I guess that answers my last question, Kirito really does have to fight Death Gun if he wants to get out of here, assuming there's really no way for him to contact the outside world from inside the game. It's not stupid because of the narrative, it's just stupid because all the characters are fucking morons. Beyond simply one and done events, you have... You also have concessions, like a, okay, like a, a shitload of anime deal with the contrivance of, you know, oh, how does this plot about saving the world just so randomly happen to fall into the li hands of fucking high school students instead of anyone else, like more competent or experienced adu adults? Anything that isn't really realistic but was clearly just done because the writer wanted something to happen that way, anything that makes the world and events feel artificial, to a small or great extent, it's a contrivance of different levels. Of course, this is also very dependent on the audience. Everyone has to have a level of suspension of disbelief. It's a requirement for fiction. There will be contrivances you must accept in basically all stories ever told. There are mi th that are minimal enough that you can ignore them and still buy into the ideas of the fictional story or at least value other things in the narrative. By realistic, quote-unquote, I don't mean true to life. I mean true to the values and systems of this fictional universe. Every piece of fiction has a slider between realism and abstraction, or cartoonism. So, uh, a cartoon face, right? A circle with two dots for eyes and a, sim a straight line for a mouth. Uh, that is an abstract representation of a human face. It is the most... It's not the most abstract, but it's very unrealistic. It does not look realistically like a human face, but it represents those ideas. It sets your expectations and your understanding for how loosely what you're seeing will translate to something, to some actual realism. If you took, like, slapstick violence from Tom and Jerry, the cartoon, but had realistic-looking animals doing those exact same violent actions, it would feel very different. Because without the cartoonism, without the setting the, the fiction away from realism and having this high level of suspension of disbelief, this high abstraction, it will feel really fucking weird as these, as these unrealistic things are happening to realistic-looking animals. So any fiction is going to have its established rules, its level of abstraction, etc. The problem with suspension of disbelief comes when those rules are inconsistent, when one piece of realism feels like it, go against, it goes against the established abstraction. 
in Nico's video, he talks about what he believes the message of this of Thirteen Sentinels' story is, and about the true nature uh, uh, nature versus nurture, how the characters wind up doing similar things across different iterations of themselves and clones of themselves. To me, that doesn't feel like an insightful philosophical examination. That feels like shitty contrivances. Lazy attempts at making dramatic irony. Oh, what a what a shocking what a shocking coincidence! The the the, the this character has no memories, but they somehow did the exact same thing. Wow, isn't that crazy? Just because the events happen in the story doesn't mean that I, the viewer, think that they are believable. I watch these scenes and I don't believe that this universe would work this way or that these events would happen this way if not for a writer shoving the world around as he pleases to make this shit happen that feels unnatural, that wouldn't happen naturally. But those aspects of dramatic irony are like, those specific ones are fine to me. I accept that level of unrealism because I understand that the intent of the irony. I wouldn't take it so far as, as to view it as, as realistic and then see it as some philosophical examination into nature versus nurture, though. See, that's the thing about fiction, is that you can just make up something in fiction and then use it as evidence for a real-life concept. That doesn't work. It doesn't mean that real humans in real life actually have these traits that are being written by a, a fiction writer in this fictional story. It doesn't mean that these are actual traits about nature versus nurture. It just means a writer made this shit up, pulled it out of his ass, and put it into a story. It's not a real observation about the world. It's not philosophy. And even then, it's not a message I would even find interesting or insightful or well-crafted. And I'm already not someone who really judges media based on what message it's trying to convey anymore. Any more than I judge a piece of media if I simply read the Wikipedia summary of it without playing it. Now, the death nail for me in this game is the sheer, unmatched, illogical, nonsense clusterfuck that is the plot. This game is the epitome of a writer just saying, I just want this shit to happen in my story, I don't care about logic, I don't care about what excuse it takes for us to get there. 99% of the game of the plot is just contrivances. Just contrivances. Just illogical nonsense. Take the time travel shit, right? Why did they think that there was time travel in the first place? Why was that a twist? Why was there a twist about it not being time travel? Well, because... Against any fucking rational logic whatsoever, the creators of the simulation... Actually, let's back up. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about it from the ground up and how stupid this whole process is. So there's a nanomachine virus whatever at this point. Humanity is wiped out. We have to save humanity by sending off a spaceship to a planet that is not infected. Fine, I guess, okay? Far off to the means of terraforming a new planet and produce human clones after the ship reaches its destination. Okay, I have some logistical questions, but that's fine, I guess. That makes enough sense. I can accept that for this kind of pulpy sci-fi. I can even accept some level of caveats because the Project Ark was already being made before it was required for humanity's survival, so some of the choices that it was already going for might be slightly less logical than if it was made from the ground up with such a dire agenda. But oh, okay, let's make it so the new humans, the clones, have to play fucking Sims 4 for the first however many years of their lives, and if they don't complete the simulation, they'll never wake up and they'll never leave the new ship on the new planet. Okay, now you're just making up bullshit excuses for your dumbass plot points. Who in the fuck would find that remotely logical as the next step in saving humanity? They have the technology. We are told explicitly they have the technology to upload their own memories onto the new clones. They have plenty of data that they could just make humans at the new location. They could do that, and it would take lay way less work than making an entire fucking simulation, all this AI shit, which would uh, require an insane amount of development time and everything to add on to this fucking project. It would be way less stupid and arbitrary. If not that, why not raise the humans in their actual environment that they'll be living in? teach them about human history. I'm sure living as a teenager in the 80s is going to be really fucking useful life experience to these kids when they step out and explore this unknown alien planet with modern futuristic technology and culture. That seems like a great way to prepare your clones for the future they'll be going into. That seems really fucking smart. What a great plan. 
I guess anyone with half a brain already died out in the human race by this point. 99% of them have been wiped out, so this plan had to just be concocted by high school dropouts and stoners, I guess. Can't be picky when most of the human race is already dead. Okay, so we're already blowing our fucking brains out with how stupid and irrational this plan is. Why not keep going? Why not make it even dumber? So we give them some dumbass simulation that... For some reason, there was no escape from until they complete it. Zero safety measures in place. Even though, and this is a plot hole I noticed at the end of the game, when the, even back when the game first launched, it was a plot hole that other people noticed, where if the real-life clones being grown in their pods, when the time loop starts over and it starts in the beginning, what happens to the clones? Are they mind-wiped? Are they, and they're continued to grow from their current age is another human grown right next to them. Zero explanation in the game. Logistical error. So to address the plot hole, the writer made some bullshit up in an interview about how the system will break down their bodies and their nanomachines and regrow them from scratch when the simulation restarts. That was obviously just an excuse that he didn't actually think of when he was writing the game to cover up for a plot hole that people noticed after it came out. And I've talked in other videos about how much it fucking bothers me when writers try to add on to their stories after the fact. I hate that shit so much, but if we take it seriously, that means that we have to believe that they created a system that would be capable of breaking down the humans in their growth pods and restarting the whole cloning process. But... They, so, they have a safety measure for when the simulation restarts, even though it was never designed to restart. They somehow built a safety measure in that case, but they didn't think to build a safety measure that let them escape their pods. Like, none of these decisions make any sense. It's so obviously just, like, whatever is convenient to force the plot to have these stupid conflicts. So, we're all the way into the shit with nonsense choices made by the backstory characters. Obviously not making rational choices that would be natural for a person to think of in these circumstances. No. They obviously just exist as an excuse to make the plot that he wants to happen happen. The story was written with the concept first, and then excuses to justify it shoved in later. The story is, I want a bunch of fucking sci-fi tropes. I want kids in mechas fighting kaiju. I want time traveling. I want nanomachines and androids, whatever the fuck. And then all the excuses for why that would be happening in, the, in this universe were just slapped together later with zero logical consistency and zero, like, just pure contrivance. Nothing that feels natural or believable whatsoever. All of it is nonsense. Next bafflingly contrived as choice. And this is, I think, the most, this is the most egregious. They make five different time periods for the clones to live in. Forget what I was saying about how it's stupid to have your kids grow up in an environment with tech and culture that's useless to how their lives will unfold once they leave the pods, or the fact that they didn't need to make this incredibly development strenuous simulation in the first place, because they could have just uploaded their actual memories, or made fake memories, or anything like that, which they already did. What genius decided that all of these different kids should come out come out from completely different time periods with different cultural values and political positions and, exp and life experiences and technology? And why? The excuse for this is next level awful and contrived and they didn't even try. They literally just didn't even try with this one. They don't have the kids grow up in modern times because they make the completely nonsensical flat earth ass assumption that anyone who grows up in their modern culture will just naturally end up ruining humanity and the world again. Which makes no sense, and they don't even try to back up this idea with anything. They just have some throwaway lines like, oh, we want these kids to grow up in the past so they'll take a different path in life. They'll lead humanity on a different path. Just more meaningless bullshit lines like that to justify this obvious contrivance to make it look like time travel, but not be time travel. But then again, it's a very anime thing to do for your core thematic conflict to be some something painfully obvious versus the dumbest, most illogical opinion in the world. You know, so like some anime story or some JRPG will have the core thematic philosophy 
philosophical rivalry of the story be like the good guy is like oh life is worth living and the bad guy would be like i will destroy the world and everything in it because nothing matters and fate and other buzzwords and this is treated by these games like a serious philosophical conflict rather than the fucking children's story that it is my brothers now the next step of our plan shall commence you must all go and spread the word of frowning <laughs> Pretty soon, everyone will embrace sadness, and there'll be no such thing as smiling! Ah! Ah! Nothing matters because we're all gonna die someday! So, against any thought that has ever entered a rational person's skull, they say, we should make different time periods for the kids to live in. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. What do we... It makes no... I'm not even going to try to form it into words what the justification for this is. What they think this will accomplish or why in, in the end result. Obviously, this is just a very flimsy excuse for why in the writing and by extension the audience would think that there's time travel, but then there isn't. I struggle to think of something that is more contrived than that in any piece of media I have ever seen in my entire life and that is not an exaggeration. Again, contrivance is something that creates the feeling of inauthenticity in storycraft. Something where the events that the, the writer wants to occur clash so heavily with what would be a natural occurrence in the world they've created. It is so utterly illogical and such a massive stretch, such a leap in logic every fucking step along the way. And all of these insane leaps in logic are just going to wind up creating the excuse for how you could have this twist in your story, in your fucking stupid anime game. Also, gotta say, kinda fucked up the way the simulation just leaves the kids off in completely wildly cir different circumstances. They all have a massively different impact on their upbringing and thus who they are once they get out of the simulation. Like, someone working on the project must have really hated Yuki, setting her on a looping path with a poor income family where her dad winds up in prison for homicide every loop. So that's the huge, big twist example, but really the whole story is a never-ending stream of little contrivances at every single point. Why did this character happen to overhear this conversation at this perfect moment? Why did these characters just run into each other so perfectly and this hyper-coincidental thing happens? Why is the plot full of dumbass MacGuffins like all these pieces of information characters just stumble across? Weird restrictions and locks and passwords and biometrics and shit. Why were these MacGuffins created by the people who made them? Like for instance, why is every single thing locked behind a biometric lock? Why? Why a biometric lock? Your society already has clones. Why Why biometric locks? Why are there locks at all? Why th Why is half this shit in the simulation? This, was ne this simulation was never made with the intention of people inside it realizing it was a simulation. This was never made to loop like this or have the people inside s investigate it like this. Why is it all the stuff inside it possible and built with these arbitrary locks and these mechanics? And it works like this because we said so? Why? Why did these few real humans all happen to interact and run into each other all the time as opposed to the countless fake people that the master AI fills their fake worlds with? Why does universal control interfere with Inaba multiple times? Inaba's like, oh, I can't contact people because universal control will detect me as an anomaly when she's just... Uh, a Tomi AI, but none of the other AIs, like none of the other people who looped through Sector Zero, or the other AIs, like the Miera AI, who's just roaming around in 1985 in a robot scout body telling everyone about fucking time travel, and Universal Control doesn't do shit to him. Literally every time I'm told something, I immediately ask, uh, why? One problem is that a lot of the stuff they're borrowing from is already media that in and of itself has some initial contrivances put in place for the story to work the way that they want it to. Like Evangelion, with this weird special connection the teenagers have to these robots that only they can pilot, instead of just being machines like a helicopter or a tank that any adult with training can handle. 13 Sentinels takes everything you have to suspend your disbelief for and all the stuff it's trying to emulate and then makes it like 10 times worse and puts them all together in the most difficult suspension of disbelief task physically possible. Every person has so many more rational choices they could have made at every moment. Everything in, way, in the way it's designed could have been designed so many more different ways. 
that are just never brought up or mentioned or acknowledged at all. And it's so obvious if you look at the plot structure and the events that every single thing happens just because. So that they can force things like, oh, a final fight against Kaiju for the fate of the world. Or a Terminator scene. Or a Total Recall scene. And shit like that. They clearly thought of these gimmicky references first, these surface level references, and then scrambled to slap on these illogical contrived messes to explain why these things happened. Most of the reasons are because we said so. This happened because we said so. These characters interacted or ran into each other, or this information was revealed to this character instead of this other information at this time because we said so. Trust me, bro. This character totally made this decision and thought it was a great idea. Or this character who learned everything they know, they know off screen only knew this much information at this point in the story, which is why they did this, but when they learned some other information off screen later, they did something else. This destroys the fun of theory crafting while playing the game because the actual answers are so fucking stupid. You lose all faith in, in bothering to make theories and make sense, especially once you get near the end and realize that a ton of the contrivances and leaps in logic are not going to get any better justifications for themselves. It's also a problem of the fact that the game doesn't do a good job of lulling you in to believe what it wants you to believe. I stand firm that the only aspect that works is the very beginning. Fairy start, Iori and the Sentinel, because that's the only point where you have a solid expectation of the genre and the tropes, and then you get sidewinded by the other shit. You expect Mecha versus Kaiju, and it's something very different. I've noticed something about mystery stories like this over time. I think it's important for a mystery, especially a long mystery story, to continue to surprise you and introduce mystery to you. Not to the twists of like, oh, I thought it was the butler, but it was in fact the maid kind of twists, but something that expands what you even thought was possible about the mystery. While not my favorite Zero Escape game, Virtue's Last Reward has a good case study for this. It's not just about answering your established questions over the many routes, it's also introducing new questions to you, throwing you off your box of expectations. Like, you can be playing for a really long time under this strict assumption that the cast is complete, only to restart on a new path and discover the corpse of the old woman that you've never seen before. Or you can be playing for like 10 fucking hours and then suddenly hit a point where Sigma is recalling memories from other lives and future events and you're like, wait a minute, what the fuck is happening? You can be playing for a long time before the ideas about androids that look like humans is even brought up as a possibility. You hit an ending and suddenly you realize that you're on the fucking moon? And that was not, you know, what you considered possible previously, but now it's in here. These come out of left field and shake up what you think the limits of the story even are. They throw you off your expectations and your predictions, especially given how relatively grounded 999 was in, by comparison. These aren't twists. These are new mysteries that are even bigger in scope than what you thought the game would be earlier. As opposed to that, 13 Sentinels has all of its concepts laid out in the prologue in just a couple hours. Just like the first, like, four or five hours or less, you immediately expect high science fiction and time travel, and, like, fate of the world shit. All of these extremely high stakes are already introduced. You're already very quickly introduced, oh, this is about the, the, the destruction of all of mankind. This is the fate of the entire human race. Everything. This is high science fiction. There's no limits. We have AI. We have nanomachines. Everything. You're introduced to all of these over-concepts, that are hard, difficult to top. So imagine a story where it's just a murder mystery, like a like a Knives Out kind of thing. But then time travel, as a mystery element, is introduced part way through the story, like maybe halfway through the story. That is a wildly different. That is wildly different in terms of a mystery structure from having a time travel mystery to begin with, but then a murder mystery happens halfway through. The murder mystery is no longer exciting or surprising to you because while it is a new mystery to you, it isn't shaking up the status quo or your understanding of the limits of the story. That's the problem with this game. It blows its load immediately. So the last thing that you that that is genuinely surprising to you is, I don't know, like seeing the fucking cat talk because that isn't something that you expect in high science fiction. That throws you off, you're like, what? 
But after that, rarely ever will you be surprised by anything. Oh, they introduce androids. Well, it's high science fiction with time travel and nanomachines and weird future space colonies. Well, it's hi-fi. They're in a simulation. Well, it's high science fiction. I've seen that twist before a million times in a dozen other science fiction stories. Nothing past the first couple hours will surprise you at all because it's all within the wide-ass box of genres that it begins with. Every reveal is something you more or less already expected and is all... In and of itself, every reveal is also just a generic copy-and-paste trope that you've seen a million times before. The only thing I didn't more or less expect was that the simulation was based off of a video game, because that's so fucking stupid. But other than that, yeah, the reveals were all underwhelmingly just genre tropes I've seen hundreds and thousands of times. The other major issue with the mystery solving, quote unquote, is the fact that the conflict is also totally toothless. Realistically, the plot is just like, not even a story, really. It's not even a conflict. The only thing that impacts the characters solving the core problem of the kaiju and like being stuck here is a couple of happenstance things they didn't really work towards and most of the story is not contributing towards. The characters somehow learning things off-screen, most of it, with no explanation for how they learned it or why other characters did not also learn the same information. 426, biggest plot contrivance in, the, in, in, in how the plot plays out, 426 knows fucking everything and does a ton of stuff to contribute to the final plan and explain what's going on to other characters, and it is never revealed how he knows any of this. Or why he knows it, but no one else does. Why couldn't anyone else have discovered this if he discovered it off-screen? A huge, monumentally important event for their success against the conflict of the narrative is when Morimura makes a clone of herself j just, just to test things out and randomly accidentally uploads the Professor Morimura from 2188 onto the clone. This happens completely by accident, could have happened at any other point with no effort or provocation as a plot point, could have happened on any previous loop of the 300 loops that have happened, and not the literal final one, because that's also the stupidest, most contrived thing ever. And it would have solved everything, literally everything instantly, because once the professor's mind was there, she can just go and fix the Dimos code and restart the loop, and it would work as intended, and everything would be totally fine. We are literally told that that would have happened. Then, Inaba, the Tomi AI, also has access to information and stuff the others don't have. Again, all of a sudden, at random, because she was shifted at random from the Battle of Sector 2 and just randomly happened to go into the computers in the mothership in orbit that none of them were aware of or knew was even physically possible to do, but this just randomly occurred with no character intending for it. They, they just randomly shifted, and she appeared there, and the um, Sentinel-17 appeared there as well. These are all, by far and away, the most important aspects that go into them getting the information they need to escape and win. And they are all fucking terrible writing. Everything that happens to progress the story and solve the main conflict happened at random, or by characters learning things off-screen with no explanation, also seemingly at random, of why they know the important stuff. There is no satisfaction to any efforts made in the plot. It is all contrivance, all the time. They could have just as convincingly said, yeah, the characters started analyzing the data in the mainframe and randomly happened to stumble across all the information they needed to instantly figure out everything and win. Even when a character does make a logical choice to pursue certain knowledge, like Goto is probably the only character that the information that he gets makes sense of how he obtained it. Like, Goto notices that Iori's body is biometrically similar to Morimura's and then uses her to study Morimura's logs behind the biometric lock. Still, why is it designed like that? It's so stupid, but that at least makes more sense than anything else. The only other conflict comes from characters with ridiculous motivations and are also equally anti-storytelling. Like, Morimura deletes the logs from the mainframe because she's embarrassed. This is literally the plot point. She destroys information that is, like, vital to all of mankind's survival because she is embarrassed 
that a different version of herself from 2188 made the nanomachine virus. So she destroys vital information because she's shy and her feelings were hurt over this embarrassment. That is fucking insane. Um, we of course have the classic, if we need a character to be a thorn, just make them madly in love with someone with the weakest justifications ever, and just make them like a totally unrelatable, obsessive stalker with zero justification. So, they tell you the technology works like this, you just have to accept it, they tell you, oh, this character's in love with this character, and you just have to accept it blindly. Ida as a conflict is hilarious because even though he's still around for most of the game, most of the final loop after the Battle of, of Sector 2, um, and he is still a threat, like he is opposing them, he just chooses to make the dumbest choices imaginable, takes no actual proactive action towards his goals for months on end, and then he just gets shot by Shinonome the one time he try tries to do something and delete Inaba. Like, do you get it? This is a plot where the core conflict is we don't have enough information, we don't know what is happening or how to fix it, the solution to that lack of knowledge is that 426 learns everything off screen with no explanation. Inaba learns everything off screen due to complete random happenstance and flimsy justifications. There is no plot, there is just things happening with weak justifications. It's insane to me just how much the game relies on, like, AI as well. Not even, like, a, an individual's AI. I just mean nameless, void AI. Like, universal control. Because what's happening is, this whole simulation is just a copy and paste of a video game. And let's not even talk about the contrivance of what would be, at the time of 2188, what would be a 30-year-old video game being... that is was just made as a pulpy, generic kaiju game. Apparently, for some reason, it is the world's most cutting-edge artificial intelligence technology in existence and has never been topped or even matched by academics, researchers, governments, big tech companies, or anything. This fucking kaiju game made AI to run all of the city's inhabitants that just get squished underneath the foot of a giant monster in the game. Every, like, the millions of people, they all have individual data sets and, like, information about their mental sets and, like, processing power to make them each one act. You, like, you thought Forspoken had high PC stat requirements? Imagine this shit. This isn't just, like, a silly throwaway joke, either. This is a nonsense plot point that is vital for the plot to justify why there are kaiju in the first place. This thing about the video game is the only justification they could have for why kaiju are in the narrative at all. Yet again, another insane plot point made to justify the game having this shallow, surface-level reference to mecha and kaiju media. But somehow this game is, like, self-constructing? Like, the AI can somehow take their simulation and adjust everything to still make the video game portion of it play out. So there's no kaiju in it, but the AI can sift through this simulation and all the files in the mainframe and pulls out the engineering schematics of the terraforming robots and modifies them with, like, guns and missiles and shit to create... Like, none of this was programmed by a human, mind you, remember. The AI can just manage to turn this sim back into a video game. It's, it's so, the AI can do everything. AI has zero limitations, any explanation is just, oh, well the AI just somehow made it happen. None of this shit was ever intended by the people who made any of this shit. Like take for instance the terminals they have to defend, right? In the gameplay. The terminals being weak points and the entire existence of the underground UFO and stuff is all video game shit, right? That's clearly a relic of when it was originally a video game. Because what other possible reason is there for a physical weak point in the simulation? Like, why is there a physical location in a simulation that you can access and, like, adjust the files? Like, if it's just a sim for the kids to grow up in, why is there something you can physically destroy that somehow affects the simulation? Like, imagine if you were playing Minecraft, and if you dig deep enough into the earth, there's a block that you can hit, and if you break it, doing so will delete all the files of Minecraft on your PC. Why? 
So, the weak points only exist to be part of this kaiju video game, but for some reason, even though the AI of the game seems to go out of its way to scrap together some kaiju to make the game work, even though they were never built to be kaiju and the game doesn't have its kaiju that it originally has when it was a video game, uh, this same video game AI does not also ensure that there's adequate mecha for the players to use. And in fact, they have to trick the terminals the terminals that only exist as part of the video game, to recognize the kaiju threat. They have to ha manually hack them. Why? Why can the computer and its AI go so far beyond human input to recreate the original video game and its mechanics, but only the bad parts that will cause problems? Not to mention the fact that having your justification of why a video game has video gamey shit in it is because the in-universe in universe, for some stupid fucking reason, it was made to copy a video game. It is the most circular reasoning ass, contrived ass writing you could possibly imagine. It's a video game, all because it's a video game. Great writing. Mostly the game is just boring. Like, soul crushingly, mind numbingly boring. This isn't really a calculable thing. Different people find different things boring. It's very experiential and fleeting. But, like, this game is fucking boring, man. It is such a slog to get through. The wide middle chunk of the game is just the most unengaging shit imaginable. Um, everything that you learn makes the story dumber and adds one more contrivance of why the fuck would it be that way. The theory crafting is really weak because the game is just a collection of surface level tropes. If you've seen a few sci-fi stories and mind fucky stories and twist based stories, you won't be surprised by anything in this. Everything just falls into your general expectation of what directions the story might go into. Every reveal is a reveal you've seen before and was already into your mental checklist of things that you kind of expect the story might do because of your knowledge and experience with tropey bullshit. It's just fucking boring. The only fun part is the beginning, the very beginning, where the story is still introducing new things and it's like really wild. New directions you didn't expect based on the status quo so far. After it's bloated itself in every direction, it's just like a boring fill in the blanks of generic explanations for what you're seeing and completely arbitrary events happening. Most scenes are a painful drip feed. A lot of them tell you stuff you already learned or already alluded to, things you already learned in other scenes. So there's a lot of repetition going on. Mostly the dialogue just obnoxiously hints at things without properly explaining them with only a few tiny nuggets of actual data in a 10 minute scene, and a lot of them follow information or events that are pretty inconsequential to the overarching story and are only really that relevant to the specific character story you're watching, almost all of which are uninteresting, and most of the characters only really impact the larger plot in that they eventually pilot the Sentinels in the final battle, so that's also very underwhelming. The parts I recall the least are the ones that have to do with each character's individual path, because they just don't sit with me much at all. It's hard to overstate just how removable so much of the game is. Like, I didn't need to see every single scene of the annoying girl with the bland personality shooting the others with the code that gives them access to the Sentinels. I could understand the entire story by only watching a few select scenes of the entire 40 hour runtime. There's so much emptiness in the game, so much obnoxious teasing of the fact that they'll eventually tell you what's going on. I scrapped a script I was working on where I was going to complain about anime writing and lots of other stuff, like JRPGs in general, like uh, like the Xenoblade Chronicle games. But um, something I wrote about in that scrapped script was how much I hate when teasing a reveal in the future is taken as a replacement for actually writing a story. Like in those games, take Xenoblade 1. There's so much shit that's obviously put in, in place for you to be like, hmm. A mystery! How intriguing! Like Shulk's origins and the flashbacks they keep teasing at, and the Bionis and the Mechana stuff and the mystery of the world and why this war is happening, etc. And why the And the story is like sixty hours long, but so much of it is spent just continuing to be like, hmm, I wonder what the secret is. What could the answer to this mystery be? And then by the time you get to the ending, and the generic backstory and the generic twists hit, and they just tell you what the mysteries are, and it's really fucking simple and really uninteresting. And you, you often don't even stop to realize how disappointing that is, because it's just like, that was just the whole plot. 
instead of writing a plot, we just teased you about a reveal for so many hours that when we eventually just told you the boring answer, that's it. That's the whole story. It was just the endless teasing and then the boring reveal. 13th Sentinel has different kind of problems than that, but this is a contributing factor. 13th Sentinels is more boring out of like the, how much time you have to sink into each of these characters and repeat all these scenes and do these dialogues and just running from this location to this location, etc. Learning shit you already learned or learning nothing or learning shit that's not interesting. The pure time sink is just rough as hell. And unlike something like Immortality, the scenes themselves are not fundamentally interesting on their own. They need to provide overarching information to be worthwhile, and the scenes themselves rarely have anything much to enjoy. There's not usually compelling dialogue or characterization or scenario most of the time. The only thing you have to look forward to for the most part is the info, and it's a very slow drip feed of that info for a plot that is really fucking dumb once you understand it. Again, Nenji's section is the best. Because it's short, it's hit, it hits the marks of like the tropes that it copies, and what strengths those tropes inherently provide, and it doesn't overstay its welcome. Now I will say, a lot of my issues with this game are issues I take with countless other anime stories and how they're told. I don't hate anime as a medium, obviously. I don't hate the medium itself, but anime and manga is very trope-heavy, just, just in a wider broad sense. They're, they're underfunded industries, they have harsh deadlines, which leads to a lot of scrapbooking shit together by um, creatives. We have to hit these quarterly projections and get this shit out by this due date. What's some, what's some, you know, easy copy-paste and copy-paste tropes that are marketable enough that we can easily distribute them and easily advertise them because everyone understands the tropes to expedite this process a bit. As a result, there's a very sizable market in Japanese culture that embraces these tropes and this quantity over quality way of storytelling as just like an accepted style of craft. In a similar way to how like, um, take the Avengers movies um, in the West have normalized a certain accepted formula of making a pop culture movie, like the Joss Whedon-esque writing. The tropey fucking characters, the game having really melodramatic, over-enthusiastic philosophy ramblings that comes across like a 13-year-old Redditor arguing about the meaning of life, the god-awful inhuman dialogue in the lifeless scene direction, these are all attributes, and the, just the insane amount of exposition dumping and everything, these are all attributes that just get copied over out of habit. There, there, there's a reason a lot of people refer to anime as an autistic medium. Not just the stereotype of that uh, lots of autistic people love a lot of anime, which is pretty accurate, but it's the idea of why that makes sense in a stereotypical way. In a negative connotation, anime lacks subtlety. Anything that it has to say thematically, it slaps you in the face, and has characters screaming from the fucking rooftops and clouds about their incredibly generic, vague, dumbass emotions and grade school level philosophies. Characters have no subtlety or subtext to what they say. They just narrate full face exactly what they feel and what it means and what they mean at all times. No matter how autistic you are, no matter how how bad at reading subtext and subtlety you are, it is impossible to misunderstand what you're being told in anime because it is so direct and ham fisted. It is so cartoonish. The cartoonification that is also an element of dramatizing and simplifying the concept down to their most aggressive and easily consumable states. Anime thrives on people with, with high suspension of disbelief. If you can look at the corniest fucking shit in the world and still take it seriously, then anime will thrive on you because all it does is take something obvious and scream it at you into somehow being even more obvious. Suspension of disbelief is the key differential. Some people can accept, accept what they see, see and feel the emotions, the cliched plots, characters and stuff, get invested easily, not be like really hypercritical of the writing and stuff, or not constantly think, how is the writer trying to direct me or make the plot go in this direction, etc. And they go along for the ride as it capitalizes on that investment as much as possible. And some people can't. 
They reject what feels unnatural and artificial. They reject contrivance. They find it difficult to care about or get invested in this. Some people can buy that they make a simulation to have kids experience human culture at different points of human history for some fucking reason, and some people cannot take it seriously at all. I think, as a writer, if you're already the th of the type, with a tall suspension of disbelief, I can understand why you'd make something like this. Other people can be happy that they can believe in what they're seeing, and, you know, I can be happy that I don't believe things unless I'm really actually deeply convinced by them. As such, even though I think this game is extremely derivative, and I think its plot is extremely poor and sloppy and barely a plot, I think its copy and paste shit show of overused tropes, and I think the moment to moment experience of the game feels lifeless and dull and uninteresting. I can't attribute these things to laziness or lack of passion from the devs. The game wasn't some sort of asset flip that just copied these elements and turned it out for lack of... lack of bothering to have the creativity to come up with something different. These things that I take issue with that happen because of suspension of belief is just... it's just too disconnected. Because they find it so much easier to believe in this shit than I do. Because this is their writing style and this is what they're used to consuming. So that's the game. A nonsense... Stitched together plot with no escalation of conflict, no logical through line, nothing that makes a narrative a narrative in the first place. And so obviously just because they came up with the surface level things they wanted to copy and paste first, and then ripping off existing sci-fi the most derivative and shallow way possible, and then trying their damnedest to fill in the blanks and pretend like there's an overarching plot that would somehow make all these trips, tropes fit together. Out of its 30 plus hour runtime, my mind was spinning from the number of expertly crafted twists and turns and from the amazing characters I'd come to know and love. Is that true? He makes it sound so cool. I was basically copy-pasting random design elements with no idea how it'd actually work. Yeah, you said it, Okino. So that's my thoughts. Without going into super nitty-gritty, uh, arguing about this plot point or that plot point, and if it's natural or this particular moment makes sense or whatever, those are my general overarching thoughts and feelings. I think, I think all of you have shit taste, but I love you and I'm happy to see your passion for something that you enjoyed. End of the day, most of the stuff is very, it's experience driven. As with most media, criticisms mean almost nothing. If I, if some, if someone enjoyed it, then they enjoyed it. You know, you can't argue against experience. If I'm going to have one sticking point, one thing I really want to express um, it's gonna be my insistence that non-linear stories are not as difficult to write as people just assume that they are. Claiming that there's this mastercrafted complex web of routes that are all perfectly balanced and appraised by the writers in this immaculate breadcrumb trail that is giving yourself- it's giving yourself and it's giving the writers way too much credit. Realistically, they wrote the story, wrote a prologue, picked out some shit to bar off until the late game, some bigger, some bigger, you know, twists to hide until later, plopped the rest of it in front of you in a pile. I also unironically do think that you should play I Was a Teenage Hexacolonist if you like 13 Sentinels. Case of the Golden Idol is a no-brainer regardless of your taste. Everyone likes Case of the Golden Idol. And also that... It's made a shocking number of the best games of 2022 lists, which is shocking, but very exciting. You were telling me a little while ago that basically there's two kinds of lists out there. There's the ones that don't include the Case of the Golden Idol, and then the ones that have people who have played the Case of the Golden Idol. Yes, I, I was about to say. <laughs> Immortality is much more art house, so even if you're into anime shit, you might not, it might not be your cup of tea. But Teenage Exocomus is just like all those same appeals, but just better crafted. Very well defined and interesting, charming anime characters, weird fucking twists and turns, extremely inventive and detailed sci-fi, a lot of player influence on the outcomes and the routes and aspects of the story to interact with. In fact, let's do that. The only reason I even played 13 Sentinels is because of word of mouth. I heard, you know, normally if I find a game really boring, I'll quit halfway through. I won't usually force myself to play something, but in this case, I knew that I couldn't stop playing back in 2020 due to how it was going to be in the public discourse of people that I hang around. Even after I was certain 
the game would not make a comeback and impress me as it kept going. My dedication to being a thorough hater was so extreme. My fucking, my fucking anime protagonist sense to never give up, kicking into high gear. I did it. I did it for all of you. I did it. I finished 13 Sentinels so that I could stand here today and complain about the things that you like. So it's only fair that I take this opportunity to gush about a game that I think you degenerates should give a chance. So, I Was a Teenage Exocolonist is one of those indie games that's like, the people who are into it are really into it. A, quite a few people's game of the year for 2022. Um, it's like a macro sim time management game where you play as a kid growing up in humanity's first exocolony. Basically with a bunch of like non-conformist Scientologist hippies that left Earth due to somewhat unclear social conditions and cult behaviors shunned by establishment governments that remained on Earth. So your group are completely on their own on an alien planet with no way back. The space voyage was like 20 years or so to the edge of the edge of the galaxy that you share with Earth. So you and the other kids have like lived your whole lives up to this point on a spaceship with the on with only historical data about life back on Earth. The game has an extremely intelligent understanding of sci-fi and futurist culture and just t it's really smart about everything that it approaches. There's this great sense that the culture and views and of the colonists that came from Earth aren't exactly how people think and act in, in real time today, but you can see how modern culture could shift into this and what future adults perceive as normal. It's an intensely detailed sci-fi setting. The technology and its limitations and the cultural impact of that technology has on daily life and how people think in all aspects of culture and um, community behaviors and uh, the, the approach to telling an alien planet story and all of the biological realities of transmitted diseases and immunities and air quality and solar patterns and etc. A lot of the game consists of like this deliciously dark contrast between the levity of being this cute kid who doesn't really fully grasp what's going on and you're having your cute little kid upbringing with all of your other friends and stuff that were born on the stratospheric and you the player playing the game your understanding of what the colony and the adults are dealing with some pretty disastrous problems that they try to keep from they try to keep away from the kids as much as possible this is the kind of route-based, choice-based game where you wake up one day and go to play with your friends and then you learn in school about fucking nuclear fusion and then the you go to bed and the next day people knock on your door to let you know that your mom died last night. It's also a conspiracy mystery surrounding the abnormalities of the alien planet. It's also a time travel story because each playthrough there is, there is heavy like wormhole time manipulation in the game. And each playthrough of the game is a loop. It is actually like a New Game Plus game where you gain further attributes and in New Game Plus you have access to memories from alternate life paths that you, you, you went through that allow you even more choices and routes and stuff to investigate. A great overarching mystery surrounding this creepy and unsettling mind melding with future events and alternate timelines and also how this will inf in influence your child's character as 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 they grow up and as they're at different stages of mental development it is a great understanding of child psychology it's fun to watch the social realities unfold in this depressing failing colony this is the sort of game where you have status effects like teenage hormones plus five to events affecting rebelliousness stats this is a game where like mage like other the other characters it, it's so, it gets so technical with how different events and routes are triggered because like this is a game where like a character can have like a meter in their character stats that's like whether or not they're more inclined to support capitalism or socialism and that's like just a personality attribute that they have that you can influence that's gauge will have an impact on what scenes trigger later on. So the presentation were relevant to you. <laughs> I just read them ahead. Yep. The <laughs> bottom one. Menstruating and breast growth, voice changing, getting erections, none of it. I'm like a doll down there. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. That's really funny. Well, which one do we want to hear about? <laughs> 
the cast is as cute as the game is depressing, and there's just so much fucking content. There's like 50 different endings and a million fucking routes and options and things to do. Everything is richly realized, character interactions and sci-fi concepts and interesting cultural examinations. Every scene is well thought out and detailed. This is actually a game where you could, like, so long as you only do one playthrough and no New Game Plus runs, you could wind up with, you could wind up in this game with totally different events and knowledge of different things than someone else who only played it through one run. You know, if you care about that. It's a good game. It's got all the pulpy goodness you get from other anime shit. It's cute. It's likable. It's uh, it, 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 it's 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 an, uh, gotten a lot of emotional whiplash, but it's much better realized and researched and thorough in its craft, and it is much more genuinely authentic and creative. I like immortality more, but you know, like it's fucking weird, and not everyone is into weird art like shit like that. Like, insert one of those clips of the secret scenes where the one is lip-singing to Candy Says for six minutes fucking straight. Immortality does have the most batshit insane plot twist of any of these games and more, but, you know, tread lightly. Anyways, happy to shill for great games that are actually going under the radar. Anyways, that's a bit from me, champs. Fuck you, and God bless. See ya.